All right, we've come to the best day of the Christian year. He is risen. He is risen indeed, and uh, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the high watermark. This is the most important day in our faith, and and maybe you've come to today. I don't know where you're at in your life right now, but maybe you've come to this day where you're thinking, I know this is the most important thing, uh, but I'm just going through some stuff in my life. Maybe you're maybe you're having a great time. Maybe your life is going great right now, but others might be thinking. I've had some failures, I've had some disappointments, just not everything's clicking on all cylinders in my life. And I wanna just encourage you with today's message. You know, the resurrection changes all that. Well, I really mean that. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a game changer for our lives. And if you if you don't believe me, I want you to stay for the next 30 minutes or so with me. And we're gonna look at a guy that absolutely needed this to happen, and it did happen. We're talking with the Apostle Peter. And uh, we're going to focus on him today. So let's get right into the text. Well, let's pray first, then we'll just dig into our text. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this incredible day, this day of celebration all around the world. Uh, Christians everywhere are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was crucified cruelly, but he rose again after being buried in that grave. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. Lord, would you encourage us on this Resurrection Sunday with this message from God's word as we study the life of Peter and how badly he needed to know this message and have it transform his life. Father, we're just like Peter. We've made mistakes. We've had disappointments. We've had failures. But Calvary covers it all and the empty grave proves there is life after our disappointment. Teach us some things. Encourage us today from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Got your Bible. We're over there in Mark chapter 16. Of course, all four gospel writers record the resurrection. And um, I'm going to focus on Mark's version of it. Mark is the earliest of the four gospels. Okay. Probably written... Um, hmm. Anywhere from 64 to 67 AD, Peter died right around the end of the, that time there, which may factor in why Mark says what he says about Peter. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they were trembled, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Okay, so the other three gospel writers, Matthew, Luke, and John, give a similar account with different details of it all telling about the empty grave, the angel, the woman coming to the tomb, this type of thing. But Mark says two words that the other three gospel writers do not include, and that's where I'm focusing today. And those two words are in verse 7. Go tell his disciples and Peter, those two words. Have you ever had a failure in your life? Have you ever let somebody down hugely and wondered if you ever were going to get out of this mess? Could it ever be the same again? Could you ever undo the damage? Maybe you said something insensitively uh, or did something. Of course, we can't go back in time, right? I think of the headlines recently in the news about uh, baseball's highest paid player, Shohei Otani of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And it came out recently that his translator, his longtime translator, had absconded funds, some four and a half million dollars from his account to pay, the story goes, that to pay off gambling debts. And Otani has made a statement he knew nothing about it. And of course, he was fired immediately by the Dodgers organization. Um, it's a big to-do and it hasn't blown over, of course. Boy, talk about an epic failure by this guy to have absconded these funds from his good friend's account. He's probably paid really good money to be the translator, but he had some gambling debts. So the story goes. Peter made some pretty big mistakes too. 
Peter, of course, being one of the 12 apostles. And I wonder if you can identify with Peter, how you may be a person that you follow Christ, you love him, but there's been times where you failed him. I certainly can identify with that. And I want us to look at basically Peter's downfall and then his way up. So I've entitled this message, Peter, down but not out. I'm here to tell you, this is Resurrection Sunday. You may be down right now, but you're not out. Now, if, if you're not in that situation, then tuck this message away in your heart for a time when you're going to need it, when you're going to need the encouragement to know that, you know something, uh, I need I need to know it's going to get better. You know, so I really want to encourage you with that. So let's let's go back a little bit in time. Now, Mark is the hardest on Peter, okay? I'm, I'm not making this up. Of the four gospel writers, he seems to say the most about Peter's... Um, uh, denial of, of Jesus and this type of thing, his boasting uh, and then denial, this type of thing. Of the four gospel writers, he seems to pile on the most. You might say, well, why did Mark do this? Um, and Mark probably wrote this gospel, 64 to 67 AD. Peter, it's probably, many scholars believe he wrote his gospel, although it's the earliest of the four gospels, it was written after Peter's death. Peter was uh, was crucified upside down, martyred for his faith. Uh, it probably happened after. So it's kind of a little easier to talk about the guy in a negative way if he's not there to <laughs> have to read it. But the fact is, uh, he comes out smelling like roses with Mark in the end. I'll prove that as we go along. Let's go, let's go back now and look at Peter's journey down. Okay. Oh, it's not very pretty, but we, but the scripture doesn't lie. Let's start with Mark chapter 14, verse 27 to 31. It's at the Lord's Supper there. And then it says there, Then Jesus said to them, meaning that those gathered at the Lord's Supper, the apostles, Judas having left by now, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Okay, so Peter makes some very pride-filled boasts here that he's going to stick with Jesus through thick or thin. I don't care what happens. You can count on me. You can take this to the bank. Maybe you've made such uh, claims to someone, uh, you know, a friend, like, don't. I'm, you can always count on me. I'll be there for you. And then when they need you the most, you you didn't come through in the clutch. I remember a woman that left our church a number of years ago, and she didn't really have a good reason for leaving the church, but it was, we were going through a difficult time. And I remember what I said to her. I said, um, you're leaving me now when I need you the most. And she was a person that I had counted on before and was always faithful in the church. And so it, it kind of was a difficult thing when she left. Um, notice it says that the others said likewise, but they didn't speak up until Peter had been bold about it. So he said, because he, he said earlier, even if all are made to stumble, I mean, he's talking about the other guys at the table there. I won't be. You can count on me. I don't know about these other bums, but, you know, you can count on me. And then he says, after Jesus says, actually, that's not how it's going to work. And then Peter opposes that and says, even if I have to die with you, he was vehement about it. He was emphatic about it. He's already, already on his way down here. Let's pick it up a few verses later. Uh, Mark 14, verse 32 to, thir to 41. This is when Jesus is praying in the garden. They came to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. He said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Okay, Peter, you just made a big claim just a few minutes earlier that even if you had to die with him, you were going to stick with him. All Jesus is asking is, I'm, I'm troubled. I, I, please just sit here and watch. Doesn't sound like a really mammoth task to do, is it? He went a little further, Jesus did, and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. You know, sometimes we make claims and we underestimate, uh, sorry, we overestimate our ability to deliver on the goods. And so Peter here isn't overtly trying to just disregard Jesus. And, and you know, Jesus asked him to pray, James and John too. But it's not that he was trying not to pray. He was trying to pray, but he was overcome with sleep. So his the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. You know, something we can't do for God out of our flesh. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's what Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 13. But we can't do anything in our own strength. It's not going to, it's not going to last. So Peter is sliding down here. He made pride-filled boasts. Now his flesh is weak. He's not even, he's not even able to pray for Jesus. It's not like he had to defend him or anything like this. It gets worse. Mark 14 verse 47 and also verse 50. Jesus was arrested in this garden of Gethsemane. Because uh, Judas knew that that's where Jesus would be. According to John's gospel, Judas knew the place. They'd often gone there as a little retreat. So he took the, took the guys with the clubs and the, and the, and, you know, the guns and, you know, this type of thing. Not guns, but, you know, so to arrest Jesus. And so here's the scene. Uh, he's being arrested in the garden. Um, verse 46, then they laid their hands on Jesus and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, John chapter 18, verse 10 tells us that the person who was standing by that did this was Peter. So the person who told, pulled his 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 uh, sword out, he would have pulled like this, reared back, and would have crossed his body and sliced off the guy's right ear. It means that he missed his head by just a few millimeters. Could have split the guy in half. Um, that sounds pretty... Courageous, doesn't it? Sounds pretty valiant. Um, but really, that was a, a snap reaction, but that's not what was called for. Jesus actually says, uh, he, Jesus, according to Luke's gospel, Jesus actually goes and touches the guy and heals his ear. He says, listen, this is not a time for this. And so verse 50 of, of that same passage in Mark 14 says, then they all forsook him and fled. Hold it here. We got to call a time out. Peter, you said, even if all others, you know, he said in verse 29, even if all are made to stumble, I will not be. Later, uh, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. He says, if everyone else, you can count on me. Even though nobody's left, I'll still be there standing with it. It says, they all forsook him and fled. Oh yeah, the other 10 left as well. But Peter was part of the company that split the scene and left Jesus all by himself, now being arrested by this mob led by Judas. Peter's failing badly here. I don't know if it's really sunk in too much yet. Let's keep going. Mark 14, verse 66 to 72. Jesus is on trial before Pilate. This is not a good scene. Now you can see that Mark has painted a picture of, of Peter here that's not very rosy. Now might, at this time you're probably thinking, what's this got to do with the resurrection? I thought this was going to be an encouraging message. Stick with me. It gets better. Let's pick it up there at Mark 14, verse 66. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. That's the first one. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said, that was the second denial. The, uh, a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you're one of them for you're a Galilean and your speech shows it. Oh, his accent gave him away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. That's the third denial. A second time the rooster crowed. Remember Jesus said, the, the rooster won't have crowed two times before you've already denied me three times. Well, just right after the third denial, the rooster crows for the second time. Then Peter called to mind 
the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Now it has sunk in. Up to this point, he's just flying by the seat of his pants. But now the moment or it hits home, you've been in the, that situation before where you were going along, whatever. And then the reality of your of your mistake, of your failure, of your disappointing somebody, it just hits you square in the face. You know that moment. It's so painful. Years ago, my mom had some important surgery in the hospital and we, uh, it was, she was going to be in the hospital three or four days and I was living out of town. My brothers lived in the city where my, Windsor, where my mom was having the surgery. So it was my responsibility to pick my mom up at the, at, when she got out of the hospital, bring her home and get her settled in this type of thing. But during the day she was in, after she had the surgery, I prayed with her the night before. My brothers went to visit her each day, brought balloons, flowers, this type of thing, went to visit her. I didn't call. I didn't visit I got busy doing church stuff. I don't know what it was. I didn't do it purposely, but I just, I let my mom down. When I arrived at the hospital the day to pick her up, it was definitely written all over her face. And it was there that I knew, oh, I've let my mom down very badly. My mom, I've, all the years I've been alive, I've rarely seen my mom cry. Saw her cry at my grandmother's funeral and a few other times, but not too many but she cried that day. I felt so terrible. You know, a thousand I'm sorry's doesn't work in a situation like that. It was quite a while before my relationship with my mom was repaired. It eventually was, you know, God healed that. But oh man, the sting of knowing I had let my mom down. I had really severely disappointed her on the time that she, she said, you know, your brothers were here, but I was waiting for you to call. I know you live out of town. I wasn't expecting you to drive down here, but I thought maybe you would call me and you didn't. I had no excuse. When we, Peter heard the cock crow, it says he called to mind the word that Jesus said. It's like he knew right then and there. At that point, he's thinking, I can't undo the damage. I'm doomed. It said he went out. When he thought about it, he wept. Other versions say he wept bitterly. The others say that that word for weep there uh, is also used. It's a loud expression of grief, especially in the mourning for the dead. It was a wailing type of grief. It was an unconsolable sobbing. Have you ever been to a funeral where someone was just, just so overwhelmed by the grief of their loss? And you said, listen, come on, and it's okay. It's no idea. And they're just inconsolable. That's what this grief was for Peter. He hit rock bottom, but you know something? There was God was already working on a way back out. Peter was down, but he was not out. Now he he may have thought he was out. He may have thought, I just blew it. I've had three years of walking with Jesus and I I, I just wadded it up like a piece of paper and threw it in the garbage can in a matter of, of, of a couple hours here. On the, on, the, on the night that Jesus needed me the most, he probably thinks he's, he's wasted it all and there's no future for him. There's no hope for him. But what he doesn't realize is, although he's down, he's not out. There's a resurrection coming. And this resurrection is going to turn everything around for Jesus. And that resurrection can turn everything around for you too. Let's take a look at this. Jesus, Peter's route down was really bad, but his route up started actually before Peter's downward spiral. Luke says something that only Luke says. So most of my verses today are from the Gospel of Mark, but I'm going to read something from Luke here. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, that's Peter, Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. You know, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus has prayed for us. Your failure is not the last thing. It's not the last page in this book of your life. Your failure is not a good place to be. You don't want to stay there. Jesus has prayed for us. He had prayed for Peter. He says, Simon, Simon. He says his name twice to reinforce it. Satan has demanded permission to sift you as wheat, and you will be sifted. 
but I got really good news. I've prayed for you. You're going to come through this. You're going to be down for a while, but you're not going to be out. You're going to come out of this and I'm going to take my righteous right hand. I'm going to pull you out of this pit of failure. You know, Jesus can do the same thing for us. And Resurrection Sunday today is the day that solidifies that hope that we have, that he'll do that for us. Then, of course, the other two words that Jesus used, or the angel said to those women, go tell his disciples and Peter. You can interpret that as especially Peter. It doesn't mean go tell his disciples, oh, and Peter, the guy that used to be a disciple, but we know he reneged. No, it means especially Peter. We know he's having a tough time. He needs to know that Jesus is risen. He's not here. This game cha has changed now. There's a comeback. And what was failure and what was, he felt down and out. This is about to turn around in a hurry here. And so let's pick up just a couple verses. I want to kind of start to bring this to a close. William Barclay, the late Bible scholar, said this, the most precious thing, actually, he, it's, these are not his words, but he said, someone once said, the most precious thing about Jesus is the way in which he trusts us on the field of our defeat. Hmm. Someone needed to hear that today. I'm going to say that again. The most precious thing about Jesus is the way in which he trusts us on the field of our defeat. We are not measured. Our, our worth to God is not measured by our, our abilities, our successes and failures, and did one way, way or the other. Jesus trusts us. He will work through us. If you and I will keep looking to Jesus, keep confessing, keep, keep seeking him, even after we've failed, God can lift us up out of, out of what our despair is. I said that Mark's gospel is the earliest of the four. He likely wrote it after Peter died because he says a lot of stuff. About, he's the hardest on Peter of the, of the four gospel writers. But Mark had a special relationship with Peter. It didn't start out that way, but we know there's some verses there. I want to give you a verse here that tells you and I that he had a special relationship with Peter. Then I'll tell you how it got to that point. 1 Peter 5 Verse 13, so Peter wrote his epistles towards the end of his life before he was martyred. And he's giving some greetings to these Jewish Christians who have been dispersed from Jerusalem Oops, um, in, the, in the persecution there. Uh, and he's giving this letter to them. And at the end of the letter, Peter gives some greetings. And he says here, um, she who is in Babylon, that's, that could be a euphemism for Jerusalem, uh, elect together with you greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Now, Mark was not Peter's son as a, as a biological son, but he was a son in the faith. That is a term of endearment. This tells us that Mark had a special relationship with Peter. When did that start, I wonder? This is later in Peter's life. He says, those who are in Babylon, I mean, Jerusalem, they greet you as does my son, Mark. My, my faithful assistant, the one traveling with me and so helpful to me in ministry. Peter and Mark met a bunch of years ago after this event. So, so Mark writes about this event, you know, at the crucifixion, but, or sorry, the resurrection. But then later, we find, not much later either, in the book of Acts, we find out that Peter was arrested by Herod. He was put in jail. He was on trial. Actually, he was on death row. And um, he was supposed to be executed, but he escaped because God sent an angel to deliver Peter out of prison. Chains fell off his hands. Prison door opened. He had the guards fall asleep. And he walked out. For, and then he, he thought, where am I going to go? He, he decided to go to one of the many house churches that were gathered in Jerusalem. And would you know it, the house he goes to, Acts 12, verse 12. So when Peter had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. I want to make a note of this. John Mark, we call him. John was his Jewish name. Mark was his Roman name. The gospel's named according to his Roman name. His audience was probably primarily Roman. But the point of the matter is, John Mark was a young man 
in this house church, his mother Mary was maybe the leader of this house church, and Peter was familiar with this particular house church. So when he got out of prison, he thought, "I gotta, I need to go somewhere where some believers are gathered. I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to Mary's house." And so, why does Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, why does he tell us that John Mark is there, the mother, uh, house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark? Because Mark plays a role here. Right after this. The Apostle Paul goes on a missionary journey with Barnabas and they take along this guy, Mark, John Mark, as their assistant. All is well. He's been, you know, he's been raised in this, this, this God-fearing home. And I wonder what went through Mark's mind that night that Peter showed up. It's like, you were on trial. You weren't even supposed to get it. But I know that we prayed for God to free you and God has done that. And wow. So Mark was, was privy to that whole process and seeing how God delivered Peter. And so there was a, a respect and, and even an awe that, that Mark would have had for Peter and how God was using Peter. And so Mark then gets chosen by Paul and Barnabas. That's a pretty big deal to go on the missionary journey and be their assistant. Uh, as a matter of fact, it says that in verse 25 of Acts 12, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. It's all things going well for Mark here. He's witnessed the release of Peter from prison. He's in awe of this. Now Paul and Barnabas, the two great apostles, have, have asked him to join them on their missionary journey. But then the wheels come off the bus in uh Acts 13, verse 13, it says, When Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, meaning John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. It's a mystery. Why did he leave them in the lurch halfway through the missionary journey? Why did he turn tail and go back home? Nobody seems to know. We do know that there was something going on there because when Paul started his second missionary journey, uh, he said, we're not taking Mark. Barnabas had said, let's take Mark. Paul says, we've already gone down that road. The guy's not reliable. We're not taking him. And actually, Paul, Paul and Barnabas, the two great missionaries, had such a sharp disagreement about it that they parted company all over Mark. If there's a guy that knows about failure, if there's a guy that knows about, I have let down some big people in my life, when they were counting on me the most, it would be this guy, John Mark. Mark. The guy that wrote this earliest of Gospels, the guy that was the hardest on Peter about his failures, but also was the one that threw him a bone at the resurrection. He said, the angel said, go tell his disciples and Peter. John has a soft spot in his, John Mark, Mark, has a soft spot in his heart for Peter because he has known failure himself. So when years later, when he wrote his Gospel, he looked back on his own life where he had an epic failure, but then God delivered him because, you know something, he picked up somewhere along the line, he picked up with Peter, and Peter took, and Peter would have known about this failure. And actually later, John Mark was also reconciled with Paul, because at the end of a couple of his epistles, he speaks glowingly of, of John Mark. I said all that to say this, the resurrection changes everything. Your life can start fresh. Like if you need a fresh start in anything in life, today's the day to do it. My goodness. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a game changer. Even if you haven't had an epic failure, even if things are going swimmingly for you, I'm, I'm happy for you. But you know, a time might come where you're going to say something you wish you hadn't. You're going to do something you wish you hadn't. You're going to mess up and regret it. And then you're going to say, oh, I can't do this. I just, I'll never get over this. And then I want you to remember John Mark. And I want you to remember Peter. God said to that angel, when you tell those ladies to go give the message back to us, you make sure you single out Peter. I got to make sure he knows there's another life waiting for him. Another spot, a, a second, a fresh start, a new beginning for him. If you read the end of John's gospel, you know that Jesus himself meets with Jesus, with Peter personally and restores him three times to make up for the three denials and it launches him to ministry. And then you read the book of Acts, Peter had a powerful ministry in the book of Acts. Would it have been even possible if he hadn't sensed that the resurrection had changed it? No, it wouldn't have. Peter could have stayed back and, and stayed in his despair and, and with his head down, no, God can't use me. 
God can still use you. This is Resurrection Sunday. But you know something? Every day is Resurrection Day because the Lord's power of his resurrection is alive in us who believe. I want to encourage you today as we close. I'm going to pray. Father, we're so thankful for this day, this most important day in the Christian calendar. Lord, the resurrection of Jesus, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. This gives us hope. Lord, as Peter needed it, yes, John Mark needed it too. Lord, we need it too. We need to know that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Even our failures and our disappointments can be turned into victories if we'll see them in the light of the empty grave and the risen Lord. Oh God, from this day forward, strengthen us, empower us, help us walk in the newness of life and in the power of your resurrection, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, we'll see you next week. God bless. I heard the preacher talking about three wooden crosses upon a hill for everyone to see. Two sinners on the outside Couldn't save themselves if they tried All I could think is, man, that sounds like me I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right always looking for a fight Thinking I can never be forgiven I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my calls Thank God for the man on the middle cross He didn't have to do it But for me he went through it A love like that I'll never understand Lord knows I don't deserve it And I know I couldn't earn it But mercy rained down on this desperate man I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right always looking for a fight Thinking I can never be forgiven I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my call Thank God for the man on the middle cross The cross is where he went Oh, but that ain't where he stayed He brought me back to life When he rose up out of that grave Someday I'll stand before him And I'll see Jesus I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right always looking for a fight Thinking I can never be forgiven I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my call